Science. Science is for everyone. When I say everyone, of course, I am also including all women. Of all ethnicities, countries around the globe, and beliefs. I am a scientist, a conservation or heritage scientist, to be precise, which is why, throughout my career, I have worked with a myriad of research subjects. Pre-Columbian garments and paintings, historical documents, including codices, elegant Viennese and British textiles, love synthesized pigments, and even paper fragments recovered from a 500-year-old pirate shipwreck. All of these research subjects have three things in common. A, they are made of bonded atoms, like everything around us. B, they are human-made, so they belong to the broad category of material culture. And C, I am interested in them. <laughs> I can trace back the beginning of my career as a scientist to a near miss at home. That sunny afternoon, I was working on yet another home experiment. Specifically, that day, I aimed to reproduce a campfire inside my bathroom, <laughs> next to a plastic shower curtain. <laughs> I remember the flickering light and the heat, and I also remember, um, why is wood and toilet paper burning at a different rate? Mother opened the door just when the curtain was catching fire, so I was safe. After a lengthy and well-earned yelling session and subsequent grounding, I received two things that changed my life. One, a sketchbook, with a handwritten message in Spanish, do beautiful things with your imagination. Like my mother, the rest of my family used to describe me as a very creative child. It is my understanding that when someone calls a child creative, what these people actually want to say is, this child gets in trouble a lot. <laughs> Two, soon after that incident, my mom enrolled me in an after-school program for children in the arts, where we made art inspired by the trips we took, either in person or using the old-fashioned internet, books. Through our trips and our art making, we used to learn how humanities were so cool. We learned about other cultures, places around the world, different eras, and artistic expressions. At the same time, our art making was a scientific process, because every trimester we got to experiment with different materials. These materials range from the ordinary, like watercolors and paper, to the extraordinary, verging on weird. I mean, with starch paste, eggs, garbage. I can say then that one of the reasons I am in science today is because of mom's handling of my near miss. When she caught me that day, just before I caused a catastrophe, she saw in me something that all of us are born with, a human superpower, curiosity which she honed. To be clear, my placement in that program was not a reward for my misdeed, but a thoughtful response. She saw that all I wanted to do was to experiment to understand how my world worked. So, by putting me in a path where I could safely experiment, creating art, she harnessed this quality that all of us have. The power to discover, the power to create, the power to innovate. She was not allowed to go to college because she was a woman, so she saw this as a parent, as a caretaker, which makes me think that all of us, you and I, trained scientists or not, we all have the same innate ability to do science and promote science, because I believe that all of us were born, in fact, very creative children. Women remain underrepresented in the majority of STEM fields. Science, technology, engineering, math. And of the women that do show interest in these fields, about 50% of them, 50, drop out between their college years and working as scientists. In contrast, the majority of humanities fields seem female-dominated, with a whopping 70% graduation rate reported in 2015 for some degrees, including art history. These 
two contrasting statistics make me wonder. Is there a way to attract more women to STEM fields by using the statistics that we know, for instance, that women are attracted to the humanities? I think so. I actually started my career as a conservation scientist enrolled in a humanities degree, art conservation, a field where the majority of professionals self-report being a woman. I chose it because the curriculum included the two things that I was already interested in, humanities, like art and archaeology, and sciences, like biology and chemistry. But after a couple of years as an art conservation student, I realized that our knowledge of the science behind material culture was limited. In other words, I realized that we needed more scientific research. I am not the kind of person that sits around waiting for someone to solve a problem. So, because I didn't know of anyone doing this at the time, I thought, I know, I'll do it. So I switched gears and left art conservation to pour myself into chemistry, right after promising everyone that I would return. To which people said, sure. They didn't believe me, but I did go back, and a few weeks before defending my doctoral dissertation in an inorganic chemistry topic, main group chemistry, if you really want to know, I showed up to the conservation school with the opening line of, remember me? I said I would come back, and I am a chemist now. How can I help? Some folks took me up on the offer, and we brainstormed on projects where scientists, art conservators, historians, and many other professionals could collaborate. That is how I truly started my career, as a conservation or heritage scientist. That is how I ended up studying material culture with science. And that is how I know that this field is, are you ready? A gateway science. That's right, you get one taste of our scientific field and you are hooked forever with science, even if you yourself decide that you do not want to become a formal scientist. And the great news is that if you do want to become a scientist, you do not have to stay within the heritage science field. Why? Because when we learn using material culture, we learn transferable skills. That is to say that we can apply our scientific knowledge to understanding similar problems that are not necessarily related to material culture. For example, a copper pipe and a copper archaeological ornament both undergo corrosion reactions, with the difference that the copper archaeological ornament is more interesting for people like me. The difference between learning with and without material culture is that when we learn with material culture, we always have a tangible context, much like with those humanities fields. Let me show you one more example of transferable skills using one material culture site. The Mayan ruins of Bonampak in southeastern Mexico. This city, like the rest of the Maya civilization, collapsed sometime around the 9th century of the Common Era. Some experts believe the collapse was driven by environmental challenges, in part linked to the production of lime plaster. This lime plaster covers many of the Mayan buildings. To obtain lime plaster, limestone needs to undergo a series of chemical reactions, the first one of needing really high temperatures. To achieve these really high temperatures, the Mayan took down too many trees, thus enabling erosion, droughts, and hunger followed. And the rest is history. Learning from this Mayan case can be a hook to so many STEM fields. Examples, lessons for climate and soil scientists are in order but also see the city planning for civil engineering. See that temples were frequently aligned with astronomical events for astronomers and mathematicians. The Mayan blue that you see there is one of the earliest synthetic pigments on Earth and is made of nanoparticles. That is an open call for chemists and chemical engineers. See, my field, it's a gateway science that can be a hook to all of these people that are interested in the humanities. For instance, women. If you don't have women, you've lost half the best people. Add to losing all these women that, one, that do not self-identify as cis women. That is a huge loss to science. Are we willing to continue losing that much science? 
I think we should stop now. And my suggestion is this, to use material culture and its relatability to attract more women to STEM by using a STEAM approach. Add the A for art, but also for applicability. Invite those humanities fields by using the science, technology, engineering, and math behind history, art, and archaeology. Let's get something straight. My suggested approach to attracting more women to STEM fields by using a STEAM approach only deals with half of the issue regarding underrepresentation. The women that drop out between their college years and working as scientists because of bullying, harassment, and discrimination is a serious problem and is real. I know that firsthand. I almost drop out. But let me go back to my original question. Is there a way to attract more women to STEM fields by using a STEAM approach? My answer is yes, because material culture is nothing but a collection of bonded atoms that were made by humans and that are interesting. Once in STEM, our commitment as educators, formal like teachers, professors, and advisors, or informal like parents putting out the fires that their creative children started, is retaining them by providing them with transferable skills, scientifically sound knowledge, and most importantly, supporting them so they are never, ever out of STEM. Thank you.